My name is Matthew Boffey. I, am, uh, I lead the worship ministry here at Christ Church, and it's just very good to be with you this morning. Please turn in your Bibles to James 5, 1 through 6, where we're going to be talking about uh, uh, r- pursuing riches uh, at the expense of others. Again, we're in James 5, 1 through 6. You can follow along in your bulletins or uh, in, your, in your Bibles if you brought one. And we're going to get right into it this morning. So hear the word of the Lord from James 5, 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for your word. All that you say is good, God. So I pray now that as we get into this text that your word would shine in our hearts to expel the darkness. In the name of your son Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, this morning, I have the privilege of preaching on everyone's favorite topic, which is money. Um, If I didn't know better, I'd say maybe Nate and Jonathan peeked ahead at the preaching calendar and thought, you know, if we move a couple things around, we can pin this text on the new kid. This is my first Sunday uh, being hired as a worship pastor. So, um, no, jokes aside, this this is actually a, a real, there's a blessing for us in this text, and we receive that blessing not by trying to juke around the rebuke, but actually by taking the rebuke head on. Uh, As is the way with the Lord, his word is always good for us. Two comments before we dive into this text. The first is is a word about who James is describing in this passage. Uh, James, pretty much every commentator agrees on this, that James is actually describing uh, non-Christians here in this text. Non-Christian Um, rich people who have come upon their wealth in unjust ways. And it's just worth being clear about that because I think if we're not careful, we we can say more than this text is saying. This text is not outright condemning wealth, although the Bible has plenty to say about wealth, and it's always a hard word. This particular passage is, is more laser focused on wealth that has been come upon unjustly. Now, you may be wondering, why would James like, interrupt, basically, his letter to a bunch of Christians with a word to non-Christians who might not even be in the room hearing the letter as it's being read, as was the case in the first century? Well, the answer is, is this, that all throughout the Bible, you, you'll see a lot of instances of God um, proclaiming judgment against anyone who is oppressing his people as a way of comforting his people. The people of God often move through the world oppressed, and they need a word of comfort. If you were to look ahead in our passage at verse 7, it says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Now, why is that therefore there? It's because more than likely, the people that James is writing to are suffering at the hands of the rich that he is condemning in verses 1 through 6. Why does James include this then in his letter? It's because sometimes the oppressed need to know that their oppressors have it coming. Imagine that you are living under the constant strain of exploitation and there is seemingly no end in sight to this imbalance against you. What do you need? You need a word from the Lord that 
eventually justice will be served. So that's what James is doing in this passage. He is announcing judgment to those who have become rich on the backs of the poor and oppressed in James's audience. And you may need a word somewhat like that today. Maybe your oppression, if you are experiencing it, is economic in nature. This is a directly applicable text to you. But maybe your oppression is more relational. Maybe you've been abandoned by a spouse. Maybe you have suffered abuse in your home from someone that was supposed to love and care for you. Maybe you've been neglected or mistreated in any number of ways, and it seems like that person has gotten away scot-free, and there is, no injust- there is no justice for you. This is a word for you this morning, that God sees all injustices and brings all injustices to account. So all of that said, even though this, the people James is describing here are the rich non-Christians who are oppressing poor Christians, that said, any Christian can learn from the rebuke that we have here. If these are the crimes that are being named among rich unbelievers, how much more should they never, ever be named among God's people, among the redeemed, among those renewed in the image of Christ? It's a sermon for another time, how Christians should handle money. So I'm not going to try and shoehorn a second sermon into this sermon. But I would be remiss if I didn't at least underscore from this text that a passage like this should deeply unseat our confidence in riches. It is very hard, I would say impossible, to get through the Bible and not understand that there are severe warnings attached to riches, whether justly gained or unjustly gained. We see here how vaporous even the biggest pile of wealth is and how powerful wealth is to lead us into evil. And so with that word of of caution, I invite us to, one, receive consolation from this text that God sees injustices and punishes them. And secondly, to receive a rebuke. If any of these crimes are being named that are being named are found among us, that we should take them seriously. Well, let's get into the, into the text. I'm calling this sermon uh, The Filthy Rich on Trial. And by filthy rich, I don't mean people who have tons of money. I mean people who have come upon their riches in filthy ways, in the ways described in this text, with dirty hands, unjustly. And here's how we're going to move through the text. The first part is the filthy rich respond to their punishment. The filthy rich respond to their punishment. The second part is the filthy rich receive their punishment. The filthy rich receive their punishment. And then lastly, the filthy rich earn their punishment. The filthy rich earn their punishment. You know, initially I had this sermon titled The Four Crimes of the Filthy Rich because the bulk of the text is describing what these rich oppressors have done. And there's all this evidence language. And so, you know, I picture this courtroom. But then I noticed something fascinating. The courtroom procedure, as we typically know it, is actually inverted in this passage. Usually, any courtroom, you see the evidence come forth. And then after the evidence has been weighed, there's a verdict given. And then you see the response of the defendant. Well, here, God calls first for the, for the defendant to respond to the punishment that's coming upon them. Secondly... He describes what that punishment is, and then after that are the crimes enumerated. And I think that that inversion of the process goes to underscore how definite God's judgment is. God knows these crimes backwards and forwards, and the verdict has already been meted out. So with that, let's look at the first section, the filthy rich respond to their punishment. Look down at verse 1 with me. This language is very strong. It says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. One translator renders it, burst into weeping, howling with grief. That is strong language. A few years ago, I stumbled upon a video of a young man receiving a a pretty severe sentence for 
a, a heinous crime that he had committed. And I'll never forget the absolute sorrow in his face as he was receiving the words from the judge. Leading up to the verdict as the judge was kind of winding up, you see the man starting to shake his head. He just can't believe what's coming. And in those words, the word guilty hits. And immediately, the young man cries out. He says, no, and he's shaking his head. And he's, he begins shaking so violently that he actually falls on the ground in the courtroom. He is completely undone. If the rich in this passage knew the miseries that were coming upon them, they would respond more severely, more dramatically than that. It is the pride of the rich that they do not consider how easily they can be undone. The world is weighted in their favor. They are not accustomed to weakness. In fact, they actually usually laugh at threats. But a text like this shows us that their laughing should be turned into mourning and even more into weeping. The irony is that the rich, who in this life are almost invincible, are under God's judgment more vulnerable than the poor. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. God's scales are not weighted. Well, what are these miseries, these punishments that deserve such a response? We see those in the second part of our text. Look down at verse 2 with me. It says, Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. James is describing the future of the rich in present circumstances. He is trying to shake them out of their dream that they are safe and to bring them into a waking nightmare of the actual reality of their lives. We've probably all known the relief of waking up from a bad, bad dream. I've, I've had this one a few times, even, I've had it even within a year, but I mostly had it when I was still in college and seminary, that I... I had come to the end of the semester, I was like, maybe I had one more exam to take, and I realized that I had been enrolled in a class all semester long and completely forgot that I had enrolled in it. I didn't go to a single lecture, I didn't do a single assignment, I didn't think, take a single test, and now the, the exam is an hour away, and I, there is nothing I can do. I am I'm absolutely going to fail the class. Even waking up from a dream like that was a relief. The nightmare James is describing for the oppressive rich is much, much worse. And it does not end. The piles of gold and silver that they had that once seemed so great and enduring and monumental have been transformed into piles of dust. And those piles are rising up to eat their flesh like fire. The wealth that was before their defense and their pride has now become evidence against them to their shame. And all that they possessed is now possessing them, consuming their flesh like fire. Strong words. Severe judgments. Again, to the economically oppressed, look at what is coming to those who are oppressing you. God does not take these injustices lightly. And if these crimes are describing you, if you are the rich oppressor, wake up. This is your life. Not the life as you know it right now. See how fleeting your piles of wealth are. Search your treasury, while there is still time, and see if any of it has blood on it, because God who sees all will bring all to account. This is a severe text. Well, these are heavy punishments. What crimes deserve heavy punishments like this? James describes them, and then we come now to the third and final part of our text, 
which are the, the four crimes of the filthy rich. And here are the crimes, hoarding, exploitation, self-indulgence, and violence. Hoarding, exploitation, self-indulgence, and violence. Let's start with hoarding. Verse 3 towards the end says, you have laid up treasures in the last days. What's significant here is this phrase, in the last days. Those are the days we're living in right now. They're the time between Christ's first coming and his second coming when he will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, Christ came 2,000 years ago. So to us, it has been a long time. In fact, we call the era in which Christ lived the ancient era. That's how long ago we understand this time to be. But God sees this time like it's a day. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus says repeatedly, keep watch, for you do not know the day nor the hour which I will come back. We are not in this endless time of luxury. We are in the last days. One commentator writes, the last days are not the anticipated years, or anticipated retirement years of the rich, but the time of God's judgment. A text, a text like this unmasks reality for all of us, rich or poor, to remind us that the era we are living in is not so secure as we like to think it is. It is the hour of judgment. So the crimes here, the crime here is not for owning wealth per se, but for holding on to wealth when night is coming, at which point our wealth will be no good. Hoarding wealth in the last days is fundamentally a matter of the heart because it reveals a core disbelief that this age is passing. If you believe this age is passing, it will change the way you live and it will especially change the way you hold your money. Speaking honestly, this is probably the crime I am most guilty of. And I would suspect maybe most of us, if we had to choose one from this list, would choose this one. I have unused dollars sitting in my bank account. And I have plans for them, but I, I wonder, especially from a t passage like this, are my plans the plans of God, or are these the plans of man? Am I storing up treasure in the last days? Like we all have to bring our accounts, literally, before the Lord in prayer and, and weigh these things according to our conscience. But I, I am sure of this, that, a more, that the more a Christian bends his or her will to the will of God, the more their treasures are going to tip toward heaven. Like a teapot being tilted on its side, it is going to change the way you handle your money if you really believe that this age is passing and the age to come is the one that endures so the challenge for us, rich or poor, is whether we are storing up treasures on earth or treasures in heaven. The next crime that's listed is the crime of exploitation. Exploitation. He says in verse 5, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. It would be really easy to direct this application point just to business owners, since the rest of us don't pay wages. And I will say, business owners, you can take this one at face value. If you are holding back wages from your laborers, pay them. Repent. I also would challenge you to carry the spirit of this crime or the spirit of what you should be doing instead into your into the way that you pay your employees you might consider whether you are shoveling profits off the top while your employees barely scrape by and if you are truly and judiciously paying those under you their fair wages again something that you have to bring before the lord as a matter of conscience but i encourage you to at least do that but to the rest of us we also need to reckon with our role in a globalized, industrialized economy where almost certainly someone is losing. 
Again, it's a matter of conscience for everyone. I'm not going to try and stand and under, put all of us under this word and tell us how we ought to shop in, in specific ways, but I am going to encourage us to at least consider our role in economic exploitation, even if it's complicit, or even if our role is complicit. Someone you might read if you're interested in weighing more of this, uh, or these ideas is Wendell Berry. He's a, he writes a lot about uh, sustainable farming and sort of fair practices and in the production of goods and, and food. And this quote I found by him in an essay I read recently is, I think, really, it should resonate with God's people because what he's doing is describing uh, values and how our values guide us. Here he's, he's comparing someone who exploits land and people for someone who nurtures land and people. This is what he says. The standard of the exploiter is efficiency. The standard of the nurturer is care. The exploiter's goal is money and profit. The nurturer's goal is health. His land's health, his own, his family's, his communities. The exploiter thinks in terms of numbers, and quantities, and hard facts. The nurturer in terms of character, condition, quality, kind. We must remember that we are stewards of creation and lovers of neighbor far, far before we are consumers of goods. People of God, we do not exist to get through the world on discounts. Discounts can be good, but that is not the chief value for the people of God. The chief value of the people of God is care for his image bearers and care for his land. So I'd encourage us not to sidestep what could be a very appropriate rebuke for us from this passage. Well, the third crime is self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. It says in verse, in verse 5, You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. The crime of self-indulgence is not enjoyment. The Bible calls us several times to enjoy what God has given us and to receive his gifts with thanksgiving. The crime of self-indulgence is that we live in luxury while others scrape by. And that we do so in an age that is passing. When we live this way, we fatten ourselves for our own slaughter. That's the language here. The language here is, is slaughter language. Which cow gets chosen for the chopping block, for the feast? The fat one. The one that gorged itself. The question for us is, are we living like, in, in terms of money, like fat cows in a day of slaughter? It's really easy, you know, to see aerial shots of celebrity mansions and go, oh, Look how luxuriously, that is so lavish. Think of all the good they could be doing with that money. We are always comparing ourselves to someone richer to justify our own luxury. It is of no concern to me how luxuriously Beyonce lives. It is of no concern to me even how luxuriously any of you live. God's not going to compare me to you guys. That's not the question. The question is very simple. Do I have an extra coat I can give away? Am I content with my excess in the face of somebody else's desperation? Or, more positively, what joy can I gain by sharing in the generosity of Christ in divesting of luxury for the sake of others? Again, the lie here is that the wealth that we have on earth is true and lasting. It is a lie. If we are wise, we will see that it's the treasures in heaven we ought to be seeking. And that if we're not seeking those, it's because there's an idol in our heart that needs to die. It's hard to put away money because money is status. And status is comfort. 
So I would call us to bring our hearts before the Lord and ask him what we really want. Well, we come to our last crime, which is the crime of violence. It says in verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. You know, this one can sort of seem like a bit of a tack on. You know, where did the violence and murder come from? Until you realize that these crimes are all interconnected. One feeds into the next, which is often the case. Things are not so simple and cut and dry. As the hoarder searches for ungathered wealth, where does he find it? In the wages of his laborers. And what does he do with those stolen wages? He increases his luxury in self-indulgence. And what happens to the laborer deprived of those wages? He falls into want. He can't pay his debts and his taxes. And he lands himself in prison where he might even die. Someone has to pay the economic toll of the abuses of the rich. That person is the poor. Thus, even the imprisonment and the in death of the poor in this passage is on the hands of the rich. So what do we do with this very heavy word for the rich oppressor? I'd call us to three things. The first is this, and it's for the poor especially. Rejoice that you have a just king who will by no means clear the guilty except by his own blood. Many of you are living under the strain of economic injustice or other kinds of injustice and oppression and abuse. I want you to hear very clearly this morning. Your God is the God of Israel who redeemed them as slaves from the hand of Pharaoh and he lured Pharaoh into the desert and drowned him. He literally opened up an ocean and swallowed Pharaoh in it. He will by no means clear the guilty. God sees, God hears, God reaches out his hand. There is a promise here for you that he will do the same for you. The second application is for those on the other side. Those who are oppressive in their pursuit of wealth. If you are the rich abusing the poor, repent. Repent while there is still time. It may be that God has graciously put you in this room to hear from this passage the miseries that will come upon you if you do not repent. But there is a promise of salvation for you that if you do, Christ forgives you and cleanses you by his blood. The third point, and this is good news for the rich and the poor, is that in Christ, all the riches of heaven are ours. In the gospel, God has turned the world economy on its head. Blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the earth. And earlier in James, he says, let the lowly brother exalt, boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. So to those of you who are poor, see the treasures of heaven flood into your account. You are richer than you could possibly imagine. And to the rich, behold a similar mercy. He has made your wealth nothing you are poorer than you could possibly imagine if you have all the riches of the world. It may be that God has mercifully shown you that your treasures are in him so that you do not live the tragedy of seeking an entire life of riches only to see it wash away and be evidence against you. Paul says in Ephesians of Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. So here is your wealth, church, that you have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
as judge, as advocate, as defender, and as benefactor. You have it all in Jesus. So you can be released from the grip of wealth. You can be released from the lie of riches. And you can even be released of the burden of oppression because the day is coming when Christ will make right all that has been made wrong. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that there is blessing for us in it, in rebuke and in consolation. Lord, make us wise. Let us not be fools. Lord, we are enlightened with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to live that way, in the way we handle our money, in the way we look to you in the face of oppression. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.